One of the greatest boxers of all time was a guy by the name of Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson has a famous quote, which is this. He says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, okay? And that's a great quote, it applies to many things. So if you're wondering why I'm talking a little bit funny, it's because I got punched in the mouth. You see that? See that? See that? Bang, yeah. So you're wondering, Ben, what did you say and who did you say it to? No, that is not what happened. Um, one of the things I'd like to do to try to stay fit and to learn is to practice uh, jujitsu. And jujitsu, by the way, is not a striking martial arts. It's grappling and all that. Uh, but sometimes striking happens. Sometimes when you're uh, wrestling, you know, elbows get thrown, knees and feet. And uh, that's what happened to me yesterday as I was training. I got whacked uh, in the mouth. But you know what? I think I'm going to be okay. I'm going to make it. So anyway, if you're wondering, is he dipping? Is there something wrong? No, I got punched in the mouth. So speaking of that, speaking of fighting, uh, we're talking about a battle that's going on really right now within the church at large and also within our culture. And I think that when you were involved in a battle in any type of warfare or combat, you have to know how do you fight? How do you engage? And uh, today we're gonna look at one of the ways we can engage in that fight, in that battle. And to do that, we're gonna open up to our book for the next several weeks and months, and that's the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles open to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number six. And really this, this, this passage here and I said this a few weeks ago, makes it clear, our battle is a spiritual battle. It's not a culture war. It is not a political battle. It may involve politics. It may involve the culture. But our battle inherently, trust me, is a spiritual battle. And I chose the book of Ephesians to deal with these various issues because I think Ephesians talks uh, in a very encouraging way to the church. It talks to us about the themes of identity and community. Identity and community, and these are themes that we definitely need to engage in and internalize as we enter into this battle. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 10 following. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, listen, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, all right? The struggle, the battle is against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, when we read these letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote to these churches, like Galatia, like Corinth, like Ephesus, like Thessalonica, we have to realize that he is dealing with problems. He is dealing with ideologies that seeped into the church and that was affecting their view of God, their view of themselves, and how to practice the Christian life. One of the ideologies that Paul battled against, and so did John many times, was that of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, the word Gnosticism means knowledge, gnosis, knowledge. It is a special knowledge. So Gnosticism was a growing ideology in the time of Paul. Gnostics believed you had to have this special knowledge. You had to be awakened and enlightened to the realities and the hierarchies in the spiritual realm. You had to be awakened to the realities of what it meant to live inside of a human body. You had to have all this special knowledge to figure out reality and how things really are. Gnosticism stole and borrowed a lot of terms from Christianity and poured new meaning into them. So though we're not... a um, fighting, I think, battling Gnosticism so much now, we are looking at engaging in an ideology that I think can be summarized in the term neo-Marxism. Vodi Bauckham, 
uh, is a scholar and a theologian, and he calls this a type of cultural, a type of cultural Gnosticism. Public intellectual and linguist John McWhorter calls this neo-Marxism actually a new religion that's seeping into our schools, our entertainment, our government, and to corporations as well. Next week, we'll get in more of the details of exactly what is this strange ideology, where did it come from, and how do we engage in it? So just hold on, tune in more next week. But for now, we've got to look at how do we live? What is the foundation of our life as an individual and as a community? Dr. Kara Powell is a researcher in Southern California, and she did an extensive research of around 2,200 young people, students. And she interviewed them, and she asked them questions. She was listening to their dreams, their problems, their hurts, their anxieties. And so she spent a lot of time researching and analyzing. And as she came out of this study, of a a cross-section of young students. She said that basically all of this could be summed up or all the issues they were dealing with or wondering about could be summed up in three big questions. Three big questions. So I want us to look at these questions today and see how these questions that are critical questions, that are heartfelt questions that young people, and I think a lot of people are asking, and see how that connects to us in this spiritual battle. See how this relates to us in this charge this morning, this challenge to put on the full armor of God. If I had some armor on yesterday, perhaps I wouldn't have this fat lip That's a whole nother thing though, right? But let's look at these three questions. What are these three questions? The first question in this study was this. It was simply the question, who am I? Who am I? A lot of questions that young people are asking today, that a lot of folks are asking today, circle around this one question and this issue of identity. Identity. Who am I? Who am I? Why do I exist? How do we view ourselves as individuals? How do I view myself as a young person or a 20-something person or a middle-aged person? How do I view myself as a man or as a woman or as a single or as someone married or a family? How How do I see myself? Who am I? Who am I? And when we ask that question to God, we can see that God gives us answers to who we are as far as our identity. Genesis 1.27 tells us what? That we are people that have been made in the very image of God. So the Bible starts off in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created everything, everything. God made everything. God knows everything. God constructed everything. So God has made this world, he has made this universe and all the particulars and all the details in it. And he put man and woman at the very center of his creation as a reflection, a reflection of his very image. So you and I have intrinsic worth, we have intrinsic value because we've been made in God's image. Now, we are not God. We do not have the ability that God has. We do not have the knowledge that God has. We are dependent people. We are born into this world as human beings, as babies. We are dependent. God is independent. But we're made and faceted in the image of God. Now, at the same time, 
that were made in God's image were not perfect. Spoiler alert, shocking. We're not perfect. We're far from perfect. As a matter of fact, we're, we're flawed. We're not just kind of flawed, we're deeply flawed. The Bible uses the term fallen. We're fallen, we're broken, we're flawed. Another word is sin, we're sinners. By, by nature and by our actions, we don't measure up to this image of God. We're broken and fallen. So when the question is asked, who am I? I am someone and you are someone made in God's image and yet at the same time, we're fallen and we're broken and we're sinful. Therefore, we're not everything that we really could be. Now, the good news is when we realize this, right, we have an understanding of our sinfulness, our separation from God, that gives us an awareness, if you would, to receive the gospel, which is the good news about what God has done for us in Christ. Can we realize that God has seen our predicament? He has seen our problem. He feels and knows and acknowledges our pain, our shame, our guilt, and our separation, and he does something about it. He comes down in Christ Christ dies and rises again in our place. He takes his shame and guilt upon us, so now I can be forgiven. Now who am I? I'm a son of God. You are a son or a daughter of God if you've trusted in Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not about what I have done, it's about what he has done. And will I say thank you to what he has done for me? Will I say thank you for dying for me? Will I say thank you for rising for me? Will I say thank you for forgiving me? Just say yes to him. And I become a son or a daughter of the living God. And that is my core identity. My identity is someone, a sinner, who has been forgiven, who is now in Christ. That is my ultimate, my primary Identity. It's not in my family as much as I love my family. Most of the people in my family. That's not my, thank you, that's not my identity. My identity is not in being an American. I love America. I love our country. That's great and wonderful. That is not my primary identity. My identity is not my past. My identity is not my skin color. My identity is not my education. My identity is someone who is in Christ. We're all, the Bible says we're all equally sinful, equally flawed, and can be equally forgiven and adopted into God's family by his grace. So our identity is someone, if you've trusted in Christ, someone who is now in Christ, who's forgiven. Am I still sinful? Yes. Am I still flawed? Yes. But God's spirit is inside of me. He's inside of you to help us to become who he's designed us to be. So the first question, I could camp out there all day long, but I'm not going to, that these young folks ask was, who am I? It's all about identity. And as the weeks play out in this series, we'll see so many of the issues that this, I think, diabolical ideology is getting at centers around the issues of identity. So we have to know who we are. Basically, I am who God says I am. That's who I am. You are who God says you are. And if God, I renew that truth in my mind, my spirit, over and over again. The second big question, according to the survey and the study, was this, where do I fit? Who am I and where do I fit? And that has to deal with the issue of 
belonging. Belonging. We all want to be a part of a community. We all want to be a part of a team. And because we live in such a fragmented society today, where our families are fragmented, our towns, our cities are fragmented, our politics are fragmented, our religions are fragmented, our culture is fragmented. So when you have so much fragmentation, the fragmentation leads to alienation and it leads for people, all of us, searching for a community, searching for a family, searching for a place where I fit in, where I belong. That's just who we are. God has made us communal people and we're searching for a community. And that's one of the things that we strive at really intentionally and passionately here at this local church at Second Baptist. We strive all that we can to build true and lasting and meaningful community for people of all ages. That is who we're, we're about. That's what we're about. A lot of, um, when I've traveled and spoken and been a part of, you know, preachers' conferences and stuff and other events like that, if you can imagine such a thing, um, you know, one of the knocks, if you would, or criticisms, say, of a large church, and our church is a large church, is, wow, you have all these thousands of people coming, but what about pastoral needs? What about community? And I always say, listen, you know, we're not a perfect church, but we strive, work, diligently, daily, am I right, all the time on how, do, how does our church grow bigger and smaller at the same time? How do we grow bigger through reaching out and how do we grow smaller or closer and that is through our community groups that happens primarily in our church through our Bible study or Sunday school classes. But that's a lot of times where people discover this sense of community. And a church like ours, that is a large church, starts to shrink, right? And you start to find that place where you belong, that place where you connect, that place where you fit. And I've said this many times about our church. Our church is a hospital for sinners and not a country club for saints, okay? That's who we are. We're all in this hospital together. We're all trying to use our gifts and talents and our strengths and weaknesses to help each other get well, to help each other to become who God has designed us to become. So the question, where do I fit, is a question of belonging. I want to belong somewhere. And that's why we have to continue as a church family to build God's community, God's way, the best that we can, the best that we can. Third, big question. First question, who am I? All right, second question, where do I fit? Third question is this, some of you already know it. What difference can I make? What difference can I make? What kind of contribution can I make with my life? I was talking to a friend of mine uh, this, this week who's an atheist, and, and we're talking about just different things. This guy's a really good friend, deep thinker, and we're talking about things. And he's saying, yeah, I'm, I'm at a point where I really think, um, you know, life is all about finding meaning and purpose. And I said, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I really do. I, I, so whether you believe in God or whether you don't believe in God, we as human beings really have difficulty living without a sense of, of purpose and meaning. So everyone, whether you're a student in the survey, whether you're an adult here today in this worship center, we wanna know in the midst of this crazy thing called life that we are making a difference, an impact with the one and only life that God has given to us. There's power, isn't there, in understanding your purpose. There's power in that. So we can understand as we grow in God, what's my purpose here in the church? What's my purpose in my work and my job? What's the purpose I have in school? 
And a lot of times, you know, especially if you're a young person here, a lot of this is just through trial and error. You have to ask yourself, well, what am I good at? What am I good at? Or what am I passionate about? And then you get into that, and then you study that. And if you can get education on that, you do that. So you can develop your sense of pur uh, purpose by understanding what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and then developing that skill and growing in that. God is concerned about the totality of our life. He's not just concerned about, you know, how I pray and how I read God's word, though that is very important. That's absolutely critical. He's concerned about how I work and how I find meaning in my work. He's concerned about how I uh, go about my schools and my studies and what I'm doing there and how I find meaning there. He's concerned about my relationships. So purpose is not simply monolithic. It's not only one thing that we do. We can begin to understand God's purposes in various areas of our life. Someone said this. They said, my purpose in my life is to know Christ and to make him known. I like that. That's pretty simple. That's pretty clear, isn't it? I can get that. You know, I just want to know Christ. How can I know Christ? How can I grow in my relationship with him, and, you know, vertically and then horizontally? How can I make him known? How can I live my life in a certain way? How can I work in a certain way? How can I study in a certain way? How can I treat others in a certain way that will allow other people to see Christ shining through me and my life and my works. The three big questions from this survey that people are asking, young people are asking, who, who am I? Where do I fit? And what difference can I, I make? You know, again, in looking at these questions, I don't think they're unique to students. I think everyone asks them. Soren Kierkegaard, the great philosopher, put it this way. He said, where am I? Who am I? How did I come to be here? What is this thing called the world? How, how did I come into the world? Why was I not consulted and if I'm compelled to take part in it, where's the director here? I want to see him. We all ask these questions. They're fundamental to who we are. And when we begin to understand God's truths, God answer, answers concerning these questions, we begin to understand what it means to put on that armor of God. To be strong in his strength is to know who I am in, in God's eyes. To, to be strong in God's strength, to have this armor on, is to know that I belong. I belong in his church, this his church, those who were called out to be a reflection of his grace and truth and light in this world that gives me strength. It gives me strength to know my purpose. That God has designed me in a unique way to use my gifts and talents here and in the marketplace. That gives me strength. That's God's strength in my life. So a question I would ask, and ask myself this question today is, what kind of person are you becoming? What kind of person am I becoming? When you look into the mirror, do you like what you see? Are you becoming a person of, of humility, of integrity, and of courage? Are you growing in your understanding of your identity and your sense of belonging and your sense of purpose? Are you receiving the strength that comes in light of this gospel? 
I think about a story about a young boy who grew up in a poor family. His mom was a Christian. His dad was not a Christian. They were both blue-collar workers. He didn't feel like he fit in. He was embarrassed and ashamed a little bit of his family, but he went to school and didn't fit in with his friends at school either, but he got by and he played sports and no one in his family went to college, but there was an uncle with some money and he gave him some money to go to college. So this Young guy started to go to college and he wanted to become an engineer, which is a good thing. We need more engineers. But something happened. While he was at college, he was not walking with the Lord and he he had this strange call that God wanted him to actually be in ministry and to be a pastor. So he left his college. He went to more of a kind of a Christian college. He told his dad what he's going to do. His dad said, son, you are wasting your life. But this young guy now, this young college student, believed this was God's call upon his life. He got involved in a local church. They started to use him on staff. He started to use his gifts. He started to grow. And God started using him to make a difference in the lives of people in that small town as he continued to follow God and this call upon his life. Now, I know that young man. Because that young man is still doing that. Young man's now an old man. That young man is my dad. He's my dad. He found his sense of identity, his sense of belonging, and the purpose for his life within the context of the local church. That's what changed his life. We all have different stories. We all have different backgrounds. But God meets us right where we are, meets us at our deepest point of need to take us where we need to go by his grace. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you for your gospel, which is simply good news. It's a pronouncement of who you are and what you've done. God, you've you've saved and you've rescued me and all my stupidity and sinfulness, God. And God, you've, you've given me hope and purpose and a second, third, fourth, fifth chance so many times, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I have a sense of who I am and where I belong and why I'm here because of you. All these questions continue to be answered in greater living color and depth because of you. And God, it's my prayer if there's someone here um, like I was years ago, like my dad was years ago, like many of us were, just a while back, without hope and without that grace, without that sense of purpose, God, may today be their day that you are calling them not to work at a church or necessarily God, but calling them simply to be in a relationship with you, to experience your grace and truth. God, may they stand and, and come down front in just a few minutes as we have this uh, time of invitation. And Lord, I thank you for others here who have already done that. They've already received you as their Lord and Savior. They're Christians. They're, they're seeking to know you, to understand their identity, their place of belonging and purpose. And God, they're looking for a church family where they can grow and learn and serve, where they can find that sense of community. You're leading them to second. God, may they stand and come and make their way down these aisles today. God, we thank you this opportunity we have to respond to what you're doing. We ask these things through Christ.